Uh, okay, good morning, everybody. As Molly introduced me, my name is Thomas Demtrick. I do see some familiar names in the attendees, but just a little introduction. Uh, I am a biostratigrapher and also an organic petrographer. Uh, I've had the fortunate uh, pleasure of working in the oil industry for over 30 years. Uh, now with RPS for the last five years, but previously with ConocoPhillips and Amico. I'd like to thank um, Abbas and Brian Cardot. I've known Brian for over 20 years. I've known Abbas for about five years now. I'd like to thank them for including RPS in this uh, Caney Shale study. And uh, what I'm going to show you today is just a small portion of the work uh, that we've conducted. We have more samples in the lab. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the integration of all the biostratigraphic data with all the other stratigraphic and sedimentological data that the Oklahoma survey have generated. <clears throat> I'd also like to thank my two colleagues in the UK, Sally Madi, who is the biostratigrapher, the palynologist who is actually looking down the microscope and generating all these data. Uh, he's, a, he's an excellent palynologist, and I think you'll see that from some of the interpretations that, that I'll, I'll be able to show you today. And the other person is Fernando Mantija Duran, who is one of our project coordinators in the UK. He makes sure all the samples uh, get pushed through the lab and uh, all the associated results and papers and everything are sent on to the Houston office. Uh, just a little presentation outline. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background um, on the project and RPS. I'll talk a little bit about the methodology, uh, talking about Paleozoic biostratigraphy is somewhat of a challenging concept, and I'll describe why that is uh, in, a, in a couple of slides. Uh, then I'll get into um, the uh, Arbuckle Wilderness outcrop samples, which I'll talk about today. I'll talk about all the kerogen and palynological interpretations um, that we've come up with. Uh, hopefully you'll find those very interesting in light of what uh, Abbas has just presented you in the regional context. And then I'll discuss a few conclusions and path forward. There's still a, a little bit of work to be done on all that. So for those of you who are not familiar with RPS, just a little bit of a plug for them. We're not as big as a Halliburton or a Schlumberger, but we are a global consultancy of about 5,000 full-time employees. And we probably have the same number of consultants and associates that work with us around the globe. Uh, RPS itself is, is predominantly an engineering and environmental consulting group, but we there is an energy group, which is based in the UK uh, with offices in Houston, Calgary, Perth, Kuala Lumpur, and I am part of that, as are the uh, biostratigraphic and laboratory services over in Northwich. Um, we do all aspects of biostratigraphy, and I'll show some of that today. And we've uh, we've had to uh, be very imaginative as to how we approach some of these Paleozoic biostratigraphic projects that we've been working on. Uh, as I mentioned, um, Paleozoic strata, uh, they are amenable for biostratigraphic study, but they are they are problematic um, simply because we don't have the um, diversity of microfossil groups that we see in the Mesozoic and Cenozoic. Mesozoic and Cenozoic, we can use large groups of different palynological flora. Uh, we have calcareous nanofossils, which are very diverse and robust, foraminifera, which are very diverse and robust, and we do not have that luxury in the Paleozoic. So we have to be very creative and imaginative as to how we um, do a biostratigraphic study in the Paleozoic. Uh, palynology and kerogen are obvious, are, 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 um, are foundational aspects. Uh, there are very good palynological biozonations that I will show you uh, in a few minutes, uh, especially for the late Paleozoic. If you think about the evolution of flora through time, uh, the evolution of woody plants in the mid Devonian, and that continues through the late Paleozoic, uh, we can use that uh, to, to construct some very good, robust uh, Paleozoic palynological biozonations. There are other microfossil groups available, such as fusilinids, uh, which are a form of uh, foraminifera. Uh, if you think about the Permian Basin, the Permian Basin stratigraphy is based very much on fusilinid biozonations, uh, but you need to have nice limestones, you need to be able to cut thin sections, 
And it's a very destructive um, procedure in that you have to make a thin section, grind it down to actually find out the taxonomy of the fusilinid and do the identifications and species characterizations. There's other fossil groups such as conodonts, but for conodonts, you need a ton of rock to actually get a useful assemblage. Uh, so there are, there are some limits uh, with other microfossil groups in, in the Paleozoic. Uh, thin section micropaleo is very useful. Uh, we have done some projects for other operators uh, where we have done thin section biostratigraphy and biofaces work. And here are a couple of examples, a couple of examples over here uh, where you can identify sponge spicules, you can identify trilobite shell fragments and other, other biological components. And you can do a, a, a very good job of um, identifying the stratigraphic, the, 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 facies, um, the, uh, the facies textures, and also use your biological components to come up with a very robust paleoenvironmental interpretation. And we are actually doing some of that right now on some caney shale, some caney shale and sycamore limestone. Um, and as mentioned, we have worked for some of the other operators in the scoop stack using some of these um, using some of these uh, procedures and methodologies. So that's a little bit of a background. <clears throat> the current study, we are part of the Caney Shale Consortium uh, for the Oklahoma survey. At present, we have analyzed completely 38 samples of outcrop and core. Uh, there are more samples sitting in the lab right now. They've just arrived and they're sitting in acid in the lab. Um, those are in the Northwich lab, which is up near Manchester. Um, Recovery of the palynology has ranged from barren samples to poor samples to actually some really, really good samples. We finally have a methodology of understanding uh, how to extract some of the palynoflora from the rocks. Uh, one of the problems in the Paleozoic I did not mention is maturity. Of course, a lot of Paleozoic clays, the rocks have been buried quite deeply. They are very mature and there's a limit as to maturity, as to how we, as to where we can extract the polynoflora. Anything above RO 1.1 or 1.2, you're just starting to destroy the polynoflora and you're not gonna get anything but charcoal briquettes out of your sample. So, so there is a maturation uh, issue to worry about. Uh, there's also a problem uh, that we, we don't quite understand that is common with most source rock reservoirs. Uh, whether it's bacterial action or some other type of uh, biogeochemical reaction that is taking place with the maturation and expulsion of hydrocarbons from source rock. <clears throat> I've seen this through my last 10, 15 years of working on unconventional reservoirs, and it, uh, it doesn't matter where you are. I've seen it in the Vaca Muerta, I've seen it in the La Luna, the Permian Basin, Nairo Barrera, Eagford. Uh, when you're in the heart of, of a nice, deep, dark source rock, for some reason, palynology is very problematic, and it's, and it's a bit worrisome, and we had that same problem here, uh, and so recently, the samples that Abbas has been collecting have not been from the heart of the source rock interval. We've been collecting samples from, from uh, auxiliary strata, so not, not necessarily the darkest shales, but maybe ones that are a little bit lighter in color. And those ones have turned out to be really, really good for palynology. Uh, how, do we do, uh, how do we do our analysis? Uh, we do uh, a kerogen sample. And essentially a kerogen sample is we hit the sample with acid H HCl to get rid of the carbonates, HF to get rid of the silicates. We do a heavy uh, liquid separation to get rid of any remaining minerals. And we put that on a slide and we look at the raw kerogen. I'm gonna show you some of that. And just, just to ease a little bit of confusion, um, organic petrographers and palynologists have a different definition of kerogen than the geochemist. Uh, as you know, the geochemical definition is organic matter that is insoluble in an organic solvent. Well, when we do a palynology mount or when we do an organic petrography mount, we're not using solvents. So anything that comes out of the rock that's organic matter, unoxidized, we refer to that as kerogen. It's a little bit different than the geochemical classification. I've just reviewed a paper uh, where the organic petrographer talked about kerogen. The paper was reviewed by a geochemist and there was a whole uh, series of emails as to, as to how, how to describe kerogen, the definition of kerogen. So the palynological definition of kerogen is any organic matter that is extracted from the rock after acid digestion. 
For the, for the palynological investigation, we count at least 300 species where possible. And then we further scan the slide looking for age significant species. And along with that, uh, we provide full plates and reports and I'm working on those right now and we'll integrate all these data with Abbas and Brian at the OGS as part of the consortium. Uh, just to give a little bit of background, uh, Abbas showed some of this. This is from Brian Cardot's 2017 uh, overview of Oklahoma shale plays. And if you look at, uh, I've, I've highlighted, uh, or at least he's highlighted in his paper, the Goddard, the Caney, uh, the Sycamore there. So he shows, uh, uh, the, the, the figure here shows and illustrates the Caney shale as being an age from anywhere from kinder in an age all the way up to Chesterian. Uh, we have currently samples from Goddard to kind of uh, limit an upper age of the Caney Shale. And we're also looking at samples from the Sycamore to hopefully give us an, an oldest age for what might be the, uh, the Caney Shale. Uh, so, this, so this is a diagram from Brian, and I'm sure that this will be revised given the work that, that Abbas and the OGS are doing right now as part of the consortium. Um, for, the, for the basis of this presentation, we are actually using a Myospore biozonation from Western Europe. This is Jeff Clayton et al. and all his workers at Trinity College in Ireland who have spent their entire career looking at the Paleozoic. It's a much more detailed myospore zonation than what have been developed than what has been developed for North America. And they use a little bit of a different, they use the European ages, uh, the European age and stages. So I'm going to be talking about those, but I am going to be correlating them back to the North American ages, uh, just, just so you can um, put yourself in the proper context. Uh, but you can see that the myospore biostratigraphy, especially, especially in this Vizayan, uh, oh, sorry, let me go back one. I wasn't supposed to do that. Especially here in this, uh, in this time interval, uh, which is associated with the Caney Shale, uh, the earlier interpretations of the Caney Shale. You can see that we have actually a very robust, and I lost my pointer, that's okay. We actually have a very, very robust biostratigraphic zonation through that uh, late Osage, Merrimack, and Chesterian. We have a very, very good myospore biozonation for that, and I'll show you some of this in, in the upcoming interpretations. Abba showed a slightly different version of this from Blakey. This is a Scotese paleo map. And the whole point that I want to make here is that even though we're using a European biozonation for the myospores, the juxtaposition of North America and Europe during the Carboniferous, during the early Carboniferous, allows us uh, to use those biozonations uh, looking at North American rocks. And I know a number of studies that have been conducted in, in the recent past uh, using, using the European myospore biozonation and applying those to Paleozoic rocks in North America. So if you had any trepidation about using this, uh, this European biozonation, uh, this paleogeographic map puts that to rest. And I think you'll see that in some of the interpretations. As Abbas mentioned, uh, there are a number of localities and cores uh, that, that are being used as part of this consortium work. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today, and this is at the request of Abbas, I'm not going to talk about any of the of the cores, the proprietary cores that we had samples from. Uh, hopefully at some point in the near future, we will be discussing that all with you. So uh, the samples that I'm going to show you today are from the Arbuckle Wilderness Outcrop. Uh, this is in, I believe it's Murray County, which is just north of the Oklahoma-Texas border here. Um, Abbas also showed this uh, this um, satellite photo of the AWO outcrop of the Caney Shale. There are six samples uh, that I'm going to talk about in a little bit of detail. Two samples from each of the lower, middle, and upper Caney outcrop. And Abba showed you some pictures of the actual outcrops. And uh, so I'm going to start going through some of the interpretations. Here are some of the lithological descriptions as provided by... Um, Abbas and his colleagues at the OGS. Uh, mudstones, black to light gray. Um, um, as you can see the depths there. And so I'm going, to, I'm going to be referring to some of these sample depths, or I'm going to be referring to these sample depths when I talk about some of the interpretations uh, that uh, uh, with respect to age and depositional environment. 
So the samples range from 22 to 235 feet uh, up, up the outcrop from lower to upper Caney. I'm going to present the kerogen descriptions. As I mentioned, the kerogen, as used in palynology, is um, all the organic matter extracted from the rock following acid digestion. So we're looking at everything, all the organic matter preserved in, in the rock sample. Um, I, I'm not going to go over this in excruciating detail, but suffice it to say that there is a shift in kerogen types as we go from the lower caney to the upper caney. Uh, the lower caney is uh, predominantly degraded and structureless or amorphous organic matter. I'll show you this in a second. But as we move up the caney into the middle and the upper caney, we start picking up structured black and brown wood. Uh, this, in an organic petrographic context, would be vitronite and inertinite. Uh, both uh, woody material and oxidized woody material. Uh, and most importantly, we start picking up marine organisms. We start seeing acrotarchs, which are a primitive, which are an ancient uh, type of marine algae, which are very common in the early Paleozoic and they continue, continue through to the recent. Uh, but because of the lack of microfossils that we see in the Paleozoic, they are very, very characteristic. Uh, and used, used extensively for Paleozoic biostratigraphy. We also pick up scalicodonts, which are the phosphatic teeth of annelid worms, similar to a conodont uh, structure or a conodont apparatus. So as we move up from the lower uh, into the upper, in the middle and upper caney, uh, we start picking up more marine organisms in our kerogen. I'll talk about that a little bit from the palynological work. And so, so, and I'll talk about the depositional environments, but, but what this essentially shows us is that we are in an overall marine environment. I'll, I'll parse that out a little bit further. Uh, and as we move further up into the Caney Shale, we pick up more and more marine influence, but we also have the structured black and brown wood, which also indicates that we have quite a bit of fluvial input, terrestrial fluvial input into the, uh, in, into the um, system. I was trying to stop shaking my, my drafting table. Here are just some photomicrographs of the kerogen to give you an idea of how of the changes as we move from the lower caney into the upper caney. So the samples from 22 feet through 150 up to 235. And you can see in the lower part here, you can see how degraded and how translucent some of those, some of that organic matter is. And that's not, that's not because of maturity, that's actually because of degradation of the organic matter. Um, but it's, it's structured organic matter, it's amorphous organic matter. And as we move up into the samples at 150 and 185, you start seeing a lot of structured black and brown wood, a lot of inertinites and vitronites. And then at the very top in the sample at 235, you have, you, you have a combination, you have a lot of degraded material, a little bit less structured black and brown wood, but it's still very present, uh, giving us that terrestrial input. And you have, a, you have that, degraded, that degraded organic matter in the background. Now getting into a little bit of the palynology, which, which um, uh, is, is, of, is of great interest, of course. Um, as mentioned, we did have some problems with some of the early work that we did extracting palynoflora from the rocks. Uh, but I think uh, given our experiences now, uh, the recovery from more recent samples um, are excellent. And I think you see here, even though, even though you may think that all these myospores look the same, they're actually characteristic. And that's actually, those are actually quite, quite nice samples and give us some very, very nice age determinations. And we have some very nice plates to put together. We will have some very nice plates to put together for the final report. Uh, starting at the bottom in the lower caney, uh, we have these species here uh, that I won't, I won't say the names, uh, but suffice to say those species and the assemblage, uh, we can make a very good age call that we are in the Visayan. And I'm going to go and show you the European stages soon, but if we correlate that over to North America, uh, samples 22 and 24 from the lower caney, uh, that gives us a mid to upper Merrimackian, Merrimackian age, uh, which is quite significant. The sample at 140 was indeterminate. 
But uh, Salih did say that if he had to give it an H call, there were things in there that told us that we were still in the early Vizan. Um, at sample 150, uh, we've actually moved up in age a little bit and the, the assemblage changes slightly. And we've moved from Hulkarian stage, the European Hulkarian stage up into the European Asbian stage. So we've gotten a little bit younger and now we are in the earliest Chesterian. Uh, so we do have a little bit of, a, of an evolution here of the flora. Uh, and it seems that we are getting from, we are moving from Merrimackian into um, early Chesterian. And I'll show that on a, on a, on a chart in a second. Uh, unfortunately, the samples at 185 and 235 were not as productive and no age calls were possible. But what I've shown you here is that as a scolicodont, and that is very char characteristic of the marine influence that we see in some of the upper samples. So if we put this together uh, into just a little summary here, uh, as I mentioned, the samples at 22 and 24 were in the Visean, were no younger than Holcarian. Uh, and um, we've actually been able to characterize this as the TS myospore zone. You'll see that on the chart in the lower part of the red box. And that, that has been characterized as Hulkarian. And if you move over to the North American stages, that is actually the mid and upper Merrimackian. Uh, the sample in 140 simply confirms that we're in early Visayan. But then the sample at 150, was the sample at 150 or was it at 140? I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, we do get the TSTC myospore zone. We have a slight evolution of the assemblage, and now we're up in the Asbian stage. We're in that TC myospore zone. So we moved out of the Merrimackian, and we've moved into the early Chesterian. So even from these six samples, uh, we do have good recovery and good assemblages that give us some very good ages that place the samples at the, at the wilderness outcrop around this Merrimackian Chesterian boundary. Um, and as, as we move and do more, more uh, and we've already looked at other samples from other core and we pull all this together into a regional context, um, I, think, I think we'll uh, confirm those ages a little bit more and we'll probably see that, that age range expand for some of the other, for some of the other uh, Caney shale material we've looked at. I have a few more minutes here. So just in conclusion, uh, the myospore assemblages indicate a late Merrimackian to early Chesterian age. Uh, I've talked about the European stages and the myospore zones. Uh, from the depositional environmental standpoint, the lower samples are dominated by myospores, degraded AOM. I believe we're still in a deltaic marine environment, though, with the AOM. The upper samples where we get increased marine influence with the acrotarchs and scolicodonts the black and brown wood, we obviously have terrestrial input, but we're still in a marine setting. And the interpretation uh, that has been put on some of these samples is that we're in a deltaic, a pro-deltaic environment, but we have significant input as shown by uh, the large number of terrestrial myospores. The assemblages are dominated by myospores, which are of a terrestrial origin. Uh, but these are these are myospores from the terrestrial origin being dumped into a marginal marine pro-deltaic environment, which, which is which is quite quite, uh, quite quite a robust interpretation. So the path forward that we have, as mentioned, we have looked at uh, other samples, Elliot Davy Jones, A.S. Morris State, and other cores. Uh, we will integrate all these. Uh, Given, given a better geographic and lithostratigraphic context, which at this moment uh, I, I do not have the privilege of having, but I will get that and discuss that with Abbas as we pull together all this into a final report. We are currently looking at additional sam samples from the Caney. We have samples from the overlying Godard that will give us an old, uh, a youngest age, possibly a youngest age for, for what the Caney shale can be. And we're also doing sycamore limestone samples. We're doing thin section micropaleo. And that'll be a very interesting set of bio and lithophases analysis for that, for that formation. So again, we need to interpret these data and bring this all into a geographic and lithostratigraphic content. But I think you'll see that even from, the, from this small sample set uh, from the AWO, uh, we do have good ages that confirm previous previous interpretations, but I think but I think we're going to see that the age of the Caney shale is going to be variable 
uh, around the basin uh, in various cores and various parts of the basin. Um, and, and we're going to interpret this. We're going to integrate this with, with Abbas and all his and all his colleagues. So I want to thank you for your time. Uh, I realize most of you are not biostratigraphers. You've had very little introduction to biostrats. So I hope you all didn't fall asleep or go out and grab a coffee. I hope I hope this was uh, hope this was of uh, interest to you all. Thank you.